So I'm going to be talking today about the work that I've been doing with Transatomic Power, commercializing a type of molten salt reactor that can consume existing stockpiles of nuclear waste. So I became a nuclear engineer in the first place because I'm an environmentalist. I think that we need nuclear power um, alongside solar and wind and hydro and geothermal if we, we want to have any hope of avoiding the devastating environmental effects of fossil fuels, of coal in particular. This photo shows um, the, the air pollution that's caused by coal in Beijing, specifically. I feel like this photo really um, epitomizes the excitement that was felt about nuclear in the 1950s and the 1960s. So this shows the Adams for, Adams for Peace truck that was uh, put together by the United States Atomic Energy Commission. And it, would, um, it was a large van that drove around the United States. It stopped in big cities and small towns and told people about nuclear power, about this new form of energy generation with the Atoms for Peace program. And people were literally lined up at the door because they were so interested in finding out more about this new technology. And in parallel with that, interestingly enough, was Walt Disney. So in, um, in 1956, Walt Disney produced a book and accompanying animated feature called Our Friend the Atom, in which he sought to demystify the science of atomic power, showing that ultimately it's just a fancy way of boiling water. I feel like now the world kind of faces a choice. So we can continue the, the great scientific tradition of trying to better understand and harness the power of the atom, or we could give in to the fear caused by the failures of the recent past, of Chernobyl, of Three Mile Island, of Fukushima, even more recently. What we were able to do um, was develop a design for a new type of molten salt reactor that can run entirely on used nuclear fuel. So it's able to consume the fuel and reduce its radioactive lifetime while generating enormous amounts of carbon-free electricity. So to put some numbers on it, if you're actually able to take all of the 270,000 metric tons of used nuclear fuel that exists worldwide right now and put it into these waste-consuming reactors, you can actually produce enough electricity to power the entire world for 72 years, even taking into account increasing electricity demand. So we, um, we want to start viewing nuclear waste as a resource to be tapped, rather than a liability to be disposed of. And we think that fundamentally it's valuable material, and we should think about what, what we can do with it. So first, we want the system to have a high burn-up, so you're using the nuclear fuel very, very efficiently. The second, we want it to be a low-pressure system, an atmospheric pressure system, so you don't have a, um, a driving force that could potentially push radioactive material beyond the site boundary. And finally, we wanted it to have a thermal neutron spectrum rather than a fast neutron spectrum. So we wanted lower energy neutrons that would reduce the material damage on the components and would fundamentally increase component lifetime and reduce the overall cost of the system. And when you stack it up this way, the only design that meets all three of these criteria are the molten salt reactor. So there are two main material changes that we make here. The first is to the moderator, so the material that slows neutrons down to the right energy level to make them more likely to induce fission. So we ended up switching to a zirconium hydride moderator surrounded by a silicon carbide cladding. And the zirconium hydride is much more effective at moderating the neutrons. It's slowing them down to the right energy level. And so with the switch to this moderator, we were able to fit five times as much salt in the reactor core itself. So we increase the power density, can make the core smaller, make the whole system significantly cheaper. With some of our estimates, it's actually um, about half the cost of conventional nuclear power uh, in terms of overnight construction costs, even cheaper than coal in the United States. And so that solves the main reason why the technology wasn't more broadly adopted in the first place. We picked the size to be 520 megawatt electric capacity, so it's the right size to replace the coal plants that are coming offline worldwide, in the U.S. especially, and also serve as an alternative for the many, many coal plants that are being built in the, well, 
elsewhere in the world, in China in particular. Here's a, um, a schematic of one of the one potential plant design. So the reactor core in here, primary heat exchangers, pumps at the top. This whole nuclear island system is contained with a small containment. And then heat is transferred out to your, um, well, pumped via your pumps and then put into your secondary steam generators and then used to drive the turbine. So this whole piece is your turbine building here. What we're able to do is, since we use a liquid fuel, which does not sustain structural damage from radiation, and also in a liquid fuel, you're able to continuously bubble out the fission products that would otherwise shut down the reaction, we're able to keep the fuel in the reactor for um, about 20 years total. And so instead of consuming just 3 or 4% of the energy, we're able to consume about 96% of the energy because we let it just simmer there for a long period of time, continually removing the fission products and some of the lanthanides. So this just shows um, how the actinide, the particular actinide levels change in our system over time. So here at time zero is the actinide composition of um, used nuclear fuel as it comes out of a light water reactor. And the important ones to note here are the plutonium-241 and the plutonium-239, so the odd-numbered isotopes of plutonium, the ones that are feasible for using in weapons. Um, and you can see that over time in the reactor, the levels of both the plutonium-239 and the plutonium-241 in particular decrease very dramatically. So we take this used nuclear fuel that has some plutonium in it. It's not, it's not really good for making weapons, but it does have some plutonium in it, and we consume all of the odd-numbered isotopes of the plutonium over, over long time scales. So we take it from something that's bad to make weapons with to something that's impossible to make weapons with. The nice thing about this, let's go back here, is that um, depending on how you do your lanthanide removal, you only have a, a small amount of actinides that come with it, and then only a small amount of additional actinide waste that comes out. So our overall long-lived actinide waste is just approximately 20 kilograms a year as, compo as uh, compared to a conventional light water reactor that has about 20,000 kilograms, 20 tons of long-lived actinide waste per year. So we're able to reduce that long-lived waste depending on how we do our um, reductive extraction by a factor of 1,000. So we've... Um, developed our, our baseline system design and the subsystem design. So we know roughly what the, um, you know, what the nuclear island is going to look like. We have a spec'd out system for the turbine. We have um, the salt processing system initially specified. So before we build the full-scale commercial plant, we aim to build a 20 megawatt thermal prototype facility, most likely at a US national lab. So the, the tricky thing with this, uh, with molten salt reactors in general, is that you have to deal with high temperatures, so on the order of 600 to 650 degrees Celsius. You have to deal with a corrosive salt environment that has everything in the periodic table dissolved in it, and it's radioactive at the same time. One of the neat things about having the system at atmospheric pressure is that you don't need as large or as heavy a containment dome as you do for a typical light water reactor. So you don't have to withstand that much pressure from the outside. Um, the main design criteria for here is that it be able to withstand a missile strike from the outside according to NRC regulations. And so we'd been playing around actually with some different uh, shell structures on the outside. So we've been working with some uh, civil engineers and some architects just playing around with how you can make it look very different visually, because I think that's actually an important piece of it. So if you can change fundamentally what the reactor looks like, so here's a different view of that same shell, you can, um, you can use civil engineering and architecture in some ways to change people's relationship. So let's take Switzerland as an example. Right now, uh, assuming the nominal operation scenario for the Swiss power plants, uh, at the end of their lifetime, we will have approximately 12,000 spent fuel assemblies uh, that will have to be disposed of. Okay? Currently, the concept is that we will have a geological repository for disposing of uh, this fuel, uh, a deep geological repository that will be able to uh, contain, let's say, this material and uh, maintain, let's say, safety uh, for the surrounding environment. A fundamental challenge is finally the behavior of 
uh, fishing products throughout the process of the life of a geological repository. I do understand that your technology does tackle uh, the, and reduces the amount of transuranic isotopes, it's clear. But at the same time, this technology, by the fact that you're burning more uh, your fuel, this means you're producing more fission products. My question is, is there a way, or a, have you thought, uh, let's say, a way based on which this containment of fission products uh, can uh, potentially yeah, uh, be safe or, or potentially uh, be uh, disposed of in a way other than a geological repository? Thank you so much for that question. Um, so the majority of our waste, um, about 96% of our waste, is in the form of shorter-lived fission products rather than the longer-lived actinides. And so the trade-off is that the fission products, they decay back down to baseline after a few hundred years for the most part, but they do have a higher heat load in that time. And for some of the fission products, as you said, you need to be careful about tracking them. And so I think the solution for that is to not put them in a deep geological repository, but put them in a close to the surface repository or even leave them in, um, in dry cask storage or uh, pool storage above ground. So I'm highly curious regarding to the costs of your solution. Can you please just guide us through the costs and comparisons regarding to other types of uh, power generation? So our current estimates show that we could build our reactor for about $1.7 billion overnight cost, so not including the financing cost of the plant. Um, and our electricity generation over the whole lifetime of the plant would be just under three cents per kilowatt hour total. Um, so that puts it at um, extremely cheap, but that's dependent very highly on lifetime and, and downtime of the plant. That's, that's our goal.